hi everyone. We're going to get deeper into skill based assessment. So, what is skill based assessment in ABA? It assesses the current skill level, identifies strengths, areas, and support areas that somebody needs. So it guides treatment plan planning, it establishes baseline and it sets individual goals. It sets the baseline for any skills. So self-help skills, communication skills, language skills, adaptive skills, community skills. And we're going to talk more about what these all are in a minute. So what is skill-based assessment? So systematic evaluation of skills. So assesses an individual's current functional and developmental abilities across multiple domains. It looks at, and we talked about those domains. The domains really do change based on your setting. Those of you working in clinics or home-based therapy will probably not work on academic skills. Those who work in schools can work on academic skills. It guides treatment planning, so it will really help identify those strengths, areas of needs, and meaningful goals for instruction. What things can we work on that will be meaningful for the family, for the individual? And it also helps us measure progress over time. Some of these package-based assessments have ways that you can monitor progress within these domains. Some of the common ones are VBMAP, ABILS, AFLS, EFL is a newer one, and then there's also Vinelin. And the other ones, PEAK is a big one that I've seen a lot of people using these days. My preference is violin. It's what I was trained on, but they are all similar. Your agency might have a strong preference for one or the other. Your BCBA or your supervisor might have a strong preference. They do all measure things a little differently, so it's also might need to be individualized for the person. Like there might be things on the violin that you're very interested, your supervisor is very interested in for this specific client, so they might switch. But these are package tools that people pay for. They do a lot of advertising. They're made with large publishing companies. And they'll always be like, this is the best one. And it's not completely wrong, but they are all just different. I wouldn't say one is the best and the others are not good. So keep that in mind when you're thinking about these things. And then I also want to say things that are not skill-based assessment, these tools, the Autism Diagnostic Observation Schedule 2 is not a skill-based assessment. It is a diagnostic tool to help find eligibility. You could potentially create a goal from that information, but it is not as thorough in all of the adaptive areas as common assessment tools. Keep that in mind. I've heard people say that they're using ADOS to build the skill-based program and it's not enough. I don't think it's enough. I think you need to use one of these to create that skill-based program or you can create your own through interviews and some skills. So I've seen companies create their own but it's hitting all the domains. So that's completely appropriate and fine. But it should not just be the ADOS. We want to identify the strengths and the needs. We want to establish baseline performance to track progress over time. And then we want to align goals and real life outcomes. So ensure skill development are meaningful and functional. And then we want to support independence and quality of life. So we build skills that enable individuals to live more autonomous and fulfilling life. So a lot of this, the one I didn't put on this is really, we work on these things also to work through behaviors. And I talked about this in the last PowerPoint, because when something's very difficult, especially for escape behavior, you might see those behaviors and that might be important to work through with the individual so that when they're at school learning something difficult, they might know how to navigate that. How do you ask for a break? How do you ask for more time? So we see less behavior. It also helps us with the behavior piece. I'm going to talk not about the academic skills, but all the possible things that might be in the skills assessment so that you can fully understand. And some of these overlap a lot. So that's okay. I might say adaptive skills and someone else might say, you know, 
social skills. So social skills is part of adaptive skills. I look at them differently. Some of these overlap and that's okay. It will depend on what model you're using. Communication skills is kind of, we have three broad things within it. The first is expressive language. So it's the requesting label or conversational skills. So it's any way you express yourself. Receptive language is when you listen and respond thing you hear. So following instruction, answering questions. And then nonverbal communication also goes here. Gestures, body language, eye contact. To build a comprehensive communication skills program, which a lot of the people you work with might need, it does involve other professionals like speech and language pathologists. Um, you want to make sure that you're always engaging in good collaborative behavior and creating a professional work environment that everyone feels comfortable collaborating in. In the past, we've had this history within this field of being know-it-alls because we all these skills, we felt like we could teach. And I'm not saying you can't. <laughs> We can teach some of this in certain circumstances with certain individuals, but whenever it starts getting difficult, there's typically a professional who went to school for these for communications, like a speech pathologist gets a master's in communication skills and how do you teach and all that. So always knowing like when things get difficult, if your supervisor seems like it's getting difficult for them to collaborate with other fields, it does help a lot. Okay, so social skills, there's lots of things that fall under social skills. I could make a 10-page list of social skills, but I'm going to talk about a couple of them. So communication is part of social skills and the ability to take turns, share toys, engage in interactions, understanding social cues and emotion, recognizing and responding appropriately to facial expressions, body language and the feelings of others, participating in group activity, engaging in cooperative play, following group rules and contributing to group tasks, making and maintaining friendships, initiating and sustaining positive peer relationships, navigating conflict and being a good friend. Social skills in the very early stages of social skill development is pretty easy to teach. You know, teaching like, hey, stop talking when your friend's talking. Listen, now respond. All that's very easy. It's later on that it gets so difficult. It gets difficult. There's a lot of cultural stuff that goes into this, but it also gets difficult because as people get older, social skills are just so complex. In some ways, you have to really rely on peers to teach this in the later stages. It's not something that we can do successfully. Early social skills, anyone can teach them. As a school psych, I got training. The counselors get training. Lots of people get training. But later on, it's really difficult. Anyone who talks to a parent of either a typical or non-typical teenager will tell you the social dynamics are impossible to navigate for them and their child. Self-help skills are really hygiene skills or body skills. It's toileting, toilet training, hygiene, personal care, dressing, taking on and off clothes, fastening shoes, grooming, brushing teeth, all the things to take care of their body, feeding, all the skills that go into feeding as well as feeding therapy when someone's a very restrictive eater and doesn't have a lot of food choices, managing personal belongings. This is where we start like touching executive functioning, <laughs> organizing and keeping track of personal items, and then safety awareness, understanding hazards, immersion, Joel response, like teaching someone to memorize their parents' number would be self-help skills. These are a huge part of what you're going to be doing with students. Adaptive is a name used for self-help, but sometimes adaptive is broader and includes communication and other things. This is going to look exactly like self-help, but I just wanted you to understand that there's different names if you're brand new to this field and don't have a lot of background. Occasionally, someone will say adaptive and I mean almost everything. So the communication skills, uh, social skills, everything. I use the word self-help because I feel like it's clear. Sometimes I'm saying adaptive skills and they mean that. You need to know what it means. When someone says self-help, those things I showed you, that's always what they mean. Okay, so communication participation skills. So this is an interesting one, and a lot of times people don't, new to the field, don't realize this is a huge part. 
So for example, navigating public spaces, understanding signs, direction, spatial awareness of community, understanding you're walking on a street and someone's walking towards you, you move to the side, move to the other side just to give each other space to pass. Sometimes that's not naturally learned and they need help understanding that. Using public transportation is a huge one. I can't tell you how. I had full public at lunch. We would go over how to use the bus and after school use the bus together so we could all practice. There's so much that goes into that. Finding the bus, buying the ticket, waiting at the right spot, knowing the time, paying and saying hi to the driver, finding a seat. It's so complicated. And you think because you've probably taken public transportation and it wasn't so hard and you learned it from your friends or your parents, you don't think it's hard, but it can be really hard. Making purchases and handling money is a huge one. So knowing, hey, I have 10 bucks, I'm in the store and I'm hungry, I want to buy something. That whole process is hard. Ordering at restaurants can be huge especially if they have communication difficulties, communicating orders, understanding menus, demonstrating appropriate etiquette. What goes in here is street stuff. Street safety is huge. And that's some of the most important things, a realistic way someone could get hurt. Sometimes people have these kind of nutty things in their head, like, I think they'll get hurt from this. And I'm like, oh, I don't think that's very likely. I'll work on them with that. But I don't know if that's super likely, but street stuff, it's one of the most common causes of injury. You want to help people with that, knowing where to cross the street, when to cross the street, how to look, not to cross the street when there's not a crosswalk, all those. If there's no sidewalk, where does somebody walk? All those things. Vocational skills. So this also falls in here. So you want to make sure you're there learning to follow multi-step instructions. Most jobs require that. Completing tasks independently, showing self-motivation, problem solving, workplace behavior and etiquette. This is huge. I taught master students and I still had to. There definitely was some neurodivergence within our group and maybe learning disabilities. But I had to teach this so much to my master students. It just depends. Some people have experiences where this is really easy by that age, but some people don't. And this is really hard for them to understand. If you're brand new and haven't had a lot of jobs, you might need some help. And that's okay. It's just your previous experience. And if someone taught you, keep that in mind and try to get support before your first day on the job or whatnot. But you also have to realize for your people you're working with, you might need to teach them this if they get a job. A time on task and productivity, that can be a huge one. Interviewing a resume, building. Again, it's something that a lot of people need taught. Play and leisure skills. We have independent play. Lots of families struggle with this. When a child engages in play, whether by themselves or with somebody else, this is the time that the parents get to make dinner. The parents get to like check their email. The parents get to do all those things. So a lot of times when these aren't well developed, the family struggles a lot and helping them develop. This is play and leisure. So it's choice. We don't say you have to do blocks right now. When my child walks in his room to play, he picks the toys. He might ask me for help acquiring things, but it is his choice. This should be their choice always. But you have to find things. So how do you engage in independent play? How do you do cooperative games if they're going to play with another person? Hobbies and creative expression, like helping them find a way to be creative, whether that's drawing, play, any kind of art stuff, making music. A lot of people gain great things from that and helping someone figure that out and use the binding, doing it for a good amount of time. And then using free time meaningful again is another thing. So Balancing structure and non-structure, a lot of the times the people we work with will be fine with the structured activities, but the second there's unstructured leisure time, they have trouble with it. So helping them figure out how to entertain themselves in those unstructured times. Executive functioning skills, planning and organizing, the ability to set goals and tasks and manage time effectively, working memory, the capacity to hold and manipulate information in the mind, impulse control, skills to reduce urges and delay gratification, 
and emotional regulation, the capacity to manage and express emotions appropriately and task initiation and completion. So ability to start and finish tasks without getting distracted. I have an entire course on my other side about how to work, build these skills with applied behavior analysis. They're super important skills. We're learning more about them all the time and what a big deal they are for the rest of someone's life because they'll touch on most things they do. Once we have these assessment results, what might we do with them? So use assessment results to write measurable goals, develop individual treatment plans based on their strengths and needs. So you also, not only do you find where there's deficits, but you're going to find where there's strengths through this. So they might be really strong in social skills. So we don't need to write them social goals, but it's nice to know that and you might want to utilize that to build other skills. For example, they're pretty decent at talking to people. You can build that into your community program where you train them to ask for directions or ask where the crosswalk is or ask someone for help, ordering, all those kinds of things. You want to prioritize skills based on age, environment, and relevance. So focus on the most functional and significant skills for the individual. So that's super important to think about social validity here. What do they want to work on? And their family, what do their family want to work on? What's the most important things for them? You can ask them that. There's safety things we might have to work on because it's safety, but otherwise, what would they like to get better at? When you get that buy-in, they do much better with the skills. If they say, I want to be better at social skills, I want to be able to communicate better with my peers, then when you come up with interventions, they're going to want to work with you. Integrate skills across multiple settings. You want to make sure you're looking at home, school, community for all your skills, and then you want to collaborate with other people. A lot of those things with emotional regulation, communication, speech and language pathologists, there's people who specialize in adaptive skills and self-help skills rely on them. SPED teachers are often really good in those areas. Counselors are often really good. School psychs. For academic skills, you always want to help work with teachers, make sure your everything is on par with like curriculum and what the student needs to know. And then with your executive functioning skills, you always want to be talking to school psychologists and counselors about that. So common ones, VBMAP assesses language and early learner skills. The ABILS evaluates broad foundational skills. The AFLS measures community vocational life skills. And the EFL assesses practical and functional daily living skills. You'll learn what your specific company does about specific company practices. Okay, these assess skills across multiple domains. They evaluate our communication, social, self-help, adaptive, community, vocational, and executive functioning skills. They focus on meaningful, practical skills that support independence, community, participation, and quality of life. And they use assessment results to guide treatment. So they identify strengths, areas of need, and individual measurable goals. We regularly reassess progress. So we regularly attempt to reassess to make sure we're working on goals that are still needed. And we're changing the program with how the person themselves are changing. Their skills are changing. 